totally threw all in. Um, what we'll do is I'll just do a quiet intro to our next speaker, Matt Lane from Squids. Matt loves to balance idealism and pragmatism to deliver the best possible outcome for clients. Matt started at Squids as a business analyst, but became frustrated with the same problems that kept happening with the traditional BA approach and the illusion of agreement. Over time, the team at Squiz have adopted and adapted a mix of user-centered research and testing processes for the design phase and agile development processes for the build phase. So with these principles from both sides being applied to the other, welcome Matt. Cool, thanks Jason. Um, so I'm totally conscious that this session is like a dead zone. I am just going to um, us all having a beer or a wine. So it's pretty light-hearted, uh, and it's mostly a bunch of stories that have, uh, I think, morals that we can learn from. Uh, so I grew up in Taupo. We had uh, family friends who had, uh, so I've got two brothers, uh, one older, one younger, and we had family friends. We had three kids the same age. Uh, I was closest with the kids who was my age, obviously, and we're still friends now. Friends studied criminology at university and ended up joining the New Zealand police. Uh, when you're in the police, sometimes you get to wear a bulletproof vest. Uh, my friends told me about um, their experience wearing a uh, bulletproof vest and said how uncomfortable uh, they found them. My friend um, had a strong suspicion that there are actually a lot of other police officers who are suffering from the same discomfort. My friend is female. Uh, there's about 9,000 police officers in New Zealand, about 20% of them are female. The bulletproof vest that the New Zealand police have are like one size fits all, or maybe there's different sizes, but they're like one body fits all, which is the male body. Um, so my question, I mean, the question that we all ask is, did they know that when they were, you know, going through the, through the procurement process for all of these bulletproof vests? And if they did work it out, were they just like, oh, doesn't matter, you know, those 20% of our employees just don't matter. Um, and I think, like, you know, our websites are, that we are all designers, I think, is what I've realized in the last year. We're all um, delivering a thing that people will consume. So the question is, if your website was a bulletproof vest, would it be respectful, generous, and helpful? Or would it fit awkwardly and cause change? I think one of the easiest ways to be likable is to, is to empathize. And these are, I always struggle with like buzz terms, like, user experience in UX and I hate that, you know, in the description of this talk, I hate acronyms because I think they're a crutch for really understanding what we are talking about. And so now whenever someone says we need to do UX, I'm always like, what does that mean? But I think what it means is we need to empathize with our users and how do we do that? Uh, we do it by those kinds of things. Techniques for encouraging it being a web project. I think those are all the things that Ruth spoke about this morning. Um, and, and just on that, and kind of what Ruth talked about, you don't need a massive budget for this stuff. As soon as you talk to someone who is a user, you've done a hundred percent more than you know otherwise. Um, usability testing doesn't need to be in a lab with a camera and eye tracking and all that stuff. It can just be paper prototypes or like click testing or whatever. There's heaps of free tools that can let us do that. Um, a few months ago, uh, my partner and I and our um, baby Flora were staying in Fred's Batch. We had had a nice day, we'd made dinner, we put Flora down, and we sat down on the couch. And I was faced with this. Um, a plethora of unfamiliar remotes and also a nice range of DVDs. So, Uh, there was a DVD, Love Actually, I've never seen that movie and I always hear people talk about it and, I, and uh, I'm aware that it's like a, uh, like a romantic comedy or whatever, but that's cool. I've always heard people talk about it and I'm like, let's, let's, uh, let's do this, let's watch Love Actually. Um, 
And Donald Norman's book, The Design of Every Day Things, he talks about seven stages, of, seven stages of action to explain the process of how we go from what we want to, to, what, we, to what we do in, in our assessment of it. And so his, uh, his, his theory is, is that we have these seven stages. We form the goal, then we form the intention, we specify the action sequence, execute the actions, perceive the state of the world, and then we interpret whether we've got what we wanted out of it. So you see the first one is the goal, the next three are the, the uh, um, execution, and then the last three are the analysis of the performance. So that was my, that was our goal. Uh, and I knew that obviously that's what I was going to do, but what is my action, action sequence? Um, I need to find all of the remotes, because they're all spread across the house. I've got to identify the remotes, because they said Panasonic and Samsung, not TV and DVD. I've got to connect the stereo to the DVD player, because um, it was connected to the iPod. I've got to turn on the stereo, I've got to turn on the DVD player, I've got to turn on the TV, I've got to open the DVD tray, but the lights are low and the button to open the tray is actually on the other side of the DVD player, not next to the tray that opens the, that, that um, lets the tray out. I've got to put the DVD into the tray, and that sounds simple, but one time I actually watched the entire second half of Goodfellas, uh, because it was a double-sided DVD, and I, and I, the, the most embarrassing thing is I've seen the movie before, and like, <laughs> at the end of that second half, which was my first half, I'm like, wow, this is way more like Pulp Fiction, I don't remember the time sequence being so confused in this movie. Um, then I've got to switch the DVD so it's not D, that's, switch the TV so it's not TV, so it's receiving the input from the DVD, and then I've got to play the DVD. But there are several remotes in my hands that will say play on them. So then I finally do all of those things and it's time for evaluation. I can see that the DVD is now playing on the TV, but because I've been mucking around with all these different things, I put the volume up loud on the stereo and I put the volume up loud on the TV. On the TV and the, the total volume is actually now really too loud and it's going to wake up floor if you're sleeping, sleeping next door. So I pick up the TV remote to turn down the, the volume, but the lights are low. <laughs> Volume here is left and right. Why would I ever want to turn the volume left? I want to turn it down. And in fact, what I really want to do is mute it because it's way too loud at the moment. But the mute button is nowhere near the volume buttons. <coughs> Which kind of brings us to something I like to think about is, and I think it has complete relevance for um, council websites, which is hiding complexity. This is what I really wanted, and this is actually how most remotes should look. Uh, this is maybe a quote for TV remote designers, but I think it's also a quote for us as, um, as website creators. Ideas are a dime a dozen that we find that oftentimes what makes, um, what's much harder is to have the discipline to, to decide um, to leave things out. And maybe another, any tool can make things bigger, more complex and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. So just because uh, I'm conscious that there aren't actually many website examples in my uh, presentation, uh, so I thought I'd, a few people said you should probably put some website stuff in there as well. Uh, this is the Timaru District Council uh, homepage on a kind of tablet view, I think. It's actually got a whole bunch of hidden information that you can see through clicks and hovers if you express interest in seeing those things. So contact, share, uh, search, or the tell us, um, pay, and forms. But there are, these things here are all obscured by default because they're probably too much information unless the person expresses interest in seeing them. And then if you scroll down the page, the header both simplifies and also changes a little bit of it and it's sticky, it stays with you, but it doesn't show you all the context that it gives you at the top of the page. I, I think that's an example of um, applying the idea of playing complexity. Uh, confusion thresholds. Um, I went on an OE with a good friend of mine in 2005, and he speaks fluent French, and I don't speak any French. We were going to meet, the first place we were going to meet was in um, Paris. He's like, don't worry, I'll meet you at the airport, don't worry about learning about any of the public transport, I'll sort it out. Meet you at the airport, everything will be fine. He wasn't at the airport. <laughs> uh, so I had to like get on the, uh, the train that takes you from the airport to the city. And I ended up at this place, I don't know where I was, but it's uh, Gare du Nord, the north station. Um, and I found a, a map of the you know, transit system in Paris. Um, 
So just like on a website, my questions are, so where am I now? Uh, where am I going and how am I going to get there? In that instance, the other questions I had were, were do I need to buy a ticket? Where do I get the ticket from? How much is it going to cost? Do I need exact change? Because I've only got giant notes that I got from the ATM when I got off the plane. Am I going to need to speak to someone to buy the ticket? Because um, I'm self-conscious of the fact that I don't actually speak any French and uh, I know that in this day and age if you travel to a, you know, I could have learned some French, but I didn't because, you know, I'm a bad person or whatever. And then I worked out I was going kind of about there, but I only had the address of the hostel, not the precise location of the address. I didn't, so I kind of worked out that's where I was going. So my next question is, how long is it going to take to walk? <laughs> <laughs> so to make it clear, I'm not criticizing the metro maps. Um, half a decade, these things have been um, developed over half a decade of, you know, that's in the 30s, I think, of the metro map. That's actually really confusing. The more you look at it, the more confusing it gets. It looks really elegant, but it's actually um, pretty hard. Um, and that's one done by a, like a UK, UK UX guru who's like actually all the lines should be curved. I mean, I don't know if that's a fake or not, but um, the point is you can, you can explain these complex systems in a whole bunch of different ways, but at the end of the day, that was me. And so I was in the position of these, um, these users that we think about now, like why can't they just understand how the website works? That was me with the Metro. So, and I think the thing is that, is that the first time you use a metro anywhere in the world, it's the most confusing thing in, a, in the world because you, coming from Wellington, you just don't have a, what they call a mental model for what you're dealing with. The second time you use a metro, incredibly easy because you're like, ah, it's just like the Paris metro, but with different color lines. Um, so mental models. Um, Mental models are uh, deeply held internal images of how the world works, images that limit us uh, to familiar ways of thinking and acting. Very often we're not consciously aware of our mental models or the effects they have on our, our behavior. So mental models are like, they're not good or bad, they're just the, the things, whenever you're not confused, you're using mental models to kind of explain the stuff that you're going through. Uh, so they, they include what a person thinks is true, not necessarily what is, but what is actually true. Similar instructions of the thing or concept they represent. Sometimes they might actually match the thing that they represent, although I think that's a conceptual model, technically. Uh, they allow a person to predict the results of their actions, uh, and they're simpler than the thing generally. Um, they only include enough information that we need to get the job done. Really good example uh, that people say all the time for thermostats. Um, so when you get into your hotel room tonight, or maybe yesterday, or whatever, if the temperature is not right, say it's, say it's cold and you want it warm, do you twist it all the way up? And most people do that. And it's because our mental model of the, of the thermostat is that it's like a tap. And the more I turn it, the faster it will get there. But the reality is, it's like a switch. If the temperature is not right, it's checked, is the temperature right? No, I'll be on. Once the temperature is right, it'll be on. So like twisting it up to 35, it doesn't make you get to 24 faster. But that's the way we file it down in our mind because we have this tap model that's kind of a really simple thing to understand. But a, a switch on a switch is like, it's beyond what most of us understand. So, sorry, I kind of jumped to the joke, wrecked it. Um, <laughs> when, we, um, when we experience something that kind of comes close to our mental models, we either um, experience confusion or frustration or humor, or a bit of both. So you've got a mental model of, of what the, uh, the rolling pin should be like. <laughs> ah, so this next one, I've been literally waiting years to put this image in the annual presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Because, and, and you can just imagine, so we laugh, and we're like, ha ha ha, no one would ever do that. But like, I bet you, it must have happened, right? Because it's great, and, like say the lights are not very bright, it's dark, maybe the person's intoxicated, that absolutely could happen. Uh, and, so, and you're like, no, it couldn't, no, it couldn't. <laughs> Why do they pick red? Why do they pick red for the boxes? 
post boxes are red. Why did they do that? They could have picked any other colour, but they made them red. Um, so when we're doing websites, the thing we need to do is, is um, find out what the relevant mental models are that our users have and fit our sites to the users' mental models. Um, so, uh, Brad mentioned earlier in the presentation about the um, tree jack stuff. This, uh, you can't quite read at the top, or maybe you can. It says, uh, where would you find the bylaw about where you can, um, where you're allowed to skateboard? And you can see that way more people look for it under recreation, oh, sorry, community and then recreation than under council bylaws. And that's because we, we're like, within a council context, it's the bylaws, obviously. But from a skateboarder's perspective, they're like bylaws. I don't even know what those are. I don't care about those things. I want to skateboard, which is a recreational activity. I mean, the reality is probably skateboarders don't care about it. <laughs> um, so my proposition is don't force, and this is universal, not just the client, to um, councils, but all clients that we make sites with, um, that we you can't force your internal structures on the outside world. The public doesn't understand them and they don't care to understand them. I mean, to abstract it from councils, think about government departments when you use their websites you have to understand their internal structures that you just, you just want to get the thing done that you're trying to do. So the last, I think it's the last section, uh, prototyping. Uh, if you do nothing else, just do really cheap, fast prototypes. Um, the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. A uh, good analogy for this, and, and sorry, the value of the prototyping is uh, that I like to think about is sketching before you paint. Very seldom could you ever imagine um, a realist painter going straight into um, the canvas before doing some sketches of what they're going to do. Um, so this guy on the left is uh, Walter Dorinti. He's one of the um, greatest industrial designers of the 20th century. Um, they're not actually in an aeroplane, they're in a warehouse that they've made look like an aeroplane. Because they, they didn't have commercial, they didn't have passenger aeroplanes. So they had no idea, like, when you put hundreds of people in a metal tube that's flying across the world, will that work? Will they be able to put their bag somewhere? Uh, will we be able to deliver them food and drinks? So they used to, um, they tested, prototyped and tested having people sit in this warehouse that looked like an aeroplane for hours at a time while they had fake air, air hostesses and host serve and uh, meals and drinks and whether they could get past each other to get to the toilets and all that kind of stuff. So imagine the cost of change of that rolled out aeroplanes that just didn't work. Um, you can use a, an eraser on the drafting table or a sledgehammer on the construction site. Uh, prototypes of questions ask lots of them. And, uh, so the main thing about prototypes is they don't need to be fully pre-fledged products. As soon as you've got a mock-up of what the thing might look like and you've got a task that you think it would help the user achieve, test it. Um, and again, there are free tools online where you can upload an image and just have click maps of where they click. Uh, this is an example. We, when we were doing the Timaru site, we were considering like getting rid of the search bar. We're like, people know search. We just put a little icon on the top right. People know to find the search in the top right. But we found through first like, testing that if there is not a bar where you put your words in, people can't use it icons by themselves to sell them enough. Um, there's a whole bunch of research that supports that. It's the same reason why an extra hamburger icon, you know, the three lines, it says the word menu because most people don't understand that that's a menu. Um, but the prototype needs to be tested on real people, ideally people like your users, and better yet, tested on your actual users. Okay, so what is this thing? Um, answer, it's the worst shopping list ever. Um, it's really heavy. Uh, it's not in the user's language. Uh, in this case, I'm the user of this. I read English the best. It's not in a very good order. It's not very scannable. It wouldn't fit in my pocket. Can't hold it in one hand. Can't check things off as I get them unless I take my hammer and chisel and feed to the supermarket. So this is like a typical shopping list. It's light and portable. It's I can't really see that it's a bit gross. Uh, it's in English, but it's got ambiguous terms on it, like XLOs. I didn't know what XLOs were, but I found out recently. The sponges, by the way, anyway, what's XLOs? Um, 
There are no quantities specified, so I see like lemons, but I'm in the supermarket. How many lemons do I get? Two, ten, I don't know. Uh, and the handwriting is a mess. There's actually some things on there that I can't even read. Um, it's not in a very good order. It's not very scannable. It would fit in my pocket. I can hold it in one hand, and I can check things off it if I take my pencil or pen with me to the supermarket, which I seldom remember to do. The other thing about, if we think about it from a user, and by, sorry, when I say uh, the user, I'm talking about the, so if we think about the kitchen being the back end, and the supermarket, the person with the shopping list, that's the front end user. Um, in, the, in, the environment, in the environment of the user, the supermarket's in an order, it's got fresh fruit and vegetables at the start, and like, uh, you know, dairy and canned goods, they're all grouped together. Uh, so if we apply like a basic metadata schema to this, we can start categorizing things and we can see that when we're in the, like, I don't know, maybe I'm just terrible in the supermarket, but often I'll get to the canned goods and I'll be like, oh, garlic, I didn't see that, I've got to go all the way back to the garlic. Uh, so we can see there that all the orange ones are from in the fresh fruit and vegetables. Uh, so how, would, might, how might a better shopping list look? Um, or what features might it have? It would be light, portable, fit in pocket, legible, scannable, unambiguous, grouped and ordered by order of uh, the soup, like thinking about the actual supermarket, and you can check things off without a pencil. I'm really um, apprehensive about showing this because I showed it to my partner the other night. Like, I'm doing this presentation, I'm writing shopping lists for people you love. And then I showed her the shopping list, and she's like, yeah. She just got some press. So if we rephrase this as, like, it's my first prototype and hasn't had a lot of user testing yet. So it's grouped into uh, the, the category, so you can see that fruit and vegetables are at the start, and it's actually rotatable, so you can like rotate it to see the other side. Then down the side, each item has a little tab, and you fold it over once you've got it. So once you get to the checkout, the sides are completely flat, and if they're not, you've missed something. So you can't leave the supermarket without missing anything on the list. They're ordered by item, so you can see the actual thing, and then once you've got to the item, you can see the quantity next to it. Yes, okay, so this is the old way in my lifetime working at Squiz, which has been about four years. This is how we, so this is how we work on the worst projects, the most disappointing things. Um, and it, it kind of comes from the, 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 that like old quote, customers always write. And I think with web development, the answer is complicated, and so who's right? Like, probably no one, probably we need to think about this. So I was thinking of what's the, you know, there's that story of um, uh, Van Halen used to specify that he wanted a martini glass of brownie and m and at the place that he was going to perform at, or else he wouldn't perform. So that's like an old wives tale or whatever, but apparently it's a true thing, and he did it because in their contract of all of the uh, specifications that they needed in a menu, People on his crew could die if they weren't wired correctly. So asking for a martini glass of brownie M&M's, and if he turned up and there was no martini full of brownie M&M's, he could deduce that they haven't followed my specifications to the T. I can't be sure that this is safe for me and my crew. We're not going to perform. So I was thinking of like what's an equivalent where we can test: is your is your vendor doing this for you? Ask them to do something that you know they know is really dumb, and if they smilingly do it for you, they're, they're, they're giving you the superficial service that like might sort you out for the next week or month or whatever. But in the long run, they're just helping you kind of wreck everything. So summary: uh, I think we just heard clapping next door, so we can't be last down. Uh, these are pretty much, uh, I think, the, the fundamental things that I'm talking about here. Empathize with your users. If they're upset, you should be upset. If they're happy, you should be happy. Um, make the required, uh, required action on that you want our users to take on your page clear. Don't let your users think. Obscure complexity whenever possible. Not everyone wants to see everything all the time. Respect users' mental models. I think this is like a, the best thing and the hardest thing. It's like work out how they think the world works, and that's how the site should work. And the most that, that the easiest and best thing is prototyping. Test, improve, repeat, test, improve, repeat. Just keep doing that. And so keep your costs of prototyping as low as possible. Try to get an iteration of testing done in 24 hours. 
If the user can't use it, it doesn't work. That is the user. Thank you very much.